Here's the question. Has anybody here ever burned maple in a pan? Go ahead and put your hand up if you have. Okay. Knowing what you know now, going back to those incidents, would it happen again? Did we learn? Yeah. We can learn. Um, I'm going to take you back in time to when I was just a wee lad. In 1982, mm -hmm. I had just built my first sugar house that I owned, and I bought an old, old, old 3 by 12 uh, king style evaporator. I think it came over on the Mayflower, and the pilgrims had bought it second hand before they came over. And that was a really nice evaporator. I loved that machine. I only kept it one year, though. I didn't know how good it was. Um, it only lasted one year. So I, when I built my sugar house, I was just going to tap 500 trees. And that's going to be it forever. Happily ever after, I keep my teaching job. I was teaching at school at St. Johnsbury Academy, a couple towns over, uh, teaching... Uh, machine trades, welding, engineering, those kind of things. They wouldn't let me teach no English because I didn't have no good grammar. But uh, not just about everything else. And I was also a ski coach there. I don't know why, but I was. Um, so I had this 3x12 evaporator. And the first day I boiled, I was so excited. I uh, was working in the woods, putting up more tubing. I planned to put up 500, but I flew past the end of the runway just a little bit, and I got 700 put up. So now I've got more taps than I've got evaporator. That was okay, because you can always make it up on nights and weekends. And so I was working in the woods, and I noticed any nick on a tree or twig was dripping sap. It's the 19th of February, 1982. You remember that day? <laughs> and so I said, huh, must be time to tap. Little did I know, nobody tapped in those years before the first of March. It just wasn't done. But I, I built a, uh, an adapter to go on my chainsaw. I got a left hand 7 uh, twist drill. Now it wasn't really a twist drill, but something like that, spur point, uh, drill, and I went out and I went to the first tree and I fired up that chainsaw and had a whole trail. I pounded the spout in and away I went. In just about four or five hours, I had the whole wood tap, 700 all tap. I was proud as punch because every, just about every hole I drilled was dripping back. I get down to the end of the pipeline when I finished, had a pretty good stream coming into my tank. Oh, was I excited. I go down to the barn that night and I told my dad, that I got the trees all tapped today. He says, that was dumb. You never got any tap out of that wood before the first of April. I said, oh, no, I bust it up now. But you know what? That year I planned to make 100 gallons of syrup, maybe 125. Because the book said I might, if I knew what I was doing, I might make a quart for tap. So on 500, that makes 125 gallons. So I kind of settled in at 100 gallons. It would be okay for me because I didn't know what I was doing. And you know what? I made 70 gallons of syrup in February that year, 100 gallons in March, and 100 gallons in April. And when the season was all done, I went down and told my dad that I made 270 gallons. I'd only planned on 100. He never retracted that statement of being dumb. <laughs> he just didn't quite understand it, because in the bucket day, if you didn't tap in advance, you waited until it's really going, and the snow got down a little, so the horses could get through easier. But I tapped early and did okay with it. Um, now, the first day I boiled, six hours of boil time before I made any syrup. And just about the time that I'm starting to make some syrup, the tank is 
at the empty point where it's time to shut down. Well, six hours to make two gallons of syrup. I said, boy, this is heavier than I thought it was going to be. The first minute that I had the fire lit, I had my pail ready to draw syrup out of that evaporator. <laughs> and that's how little I knew. Okay, now the second day comes along. And I uh, went out to the sugar house. It frozen hard overnight. And the pans were completely frozen. A little skin of syrup on the front pan. Boy, that tastes was good. I just wiped my finger across. Oh, that's good. As I was doing that, I noticed in that pan a little milk stuck in the ice. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I said, it took me six hours to get these pans sweetened up. I can't just dump that. So I said, well, maybe nobody will find out. So I started the fire going. I got it thawed out so I could pull the mouth out. And I took him out behind the sugar house and threw him up in the woods. Went back in and started things going in good shape. And just about the time I make my first bit of syrup that day, and my bucket wasn't ready, by the way, because it's going to be another six hours to make syrup. So I wasn't ready, and, and here we go. We got syrup. So I get that going, get it filtered. Just then my mother stepped through the door of the sugar house. And she was the fussiest person in the world about the syrup that she had. Had to be really light, fancy syrup. And uh, I said, Oh no, she's going to want a sample of that. But sure enough, she says, Can I have a sample of that syrup? And I said, Yeah. And I knew if she tasted milk in that syrup, I was going to get another beating. <laughs> And I knew if I didn't want to have a sample, I'd get a bigger beating. So I chose the smaller of the two evils, and she took a sample of that syrup. She says, wow, that's just as good as what your grandfather used to make. You know what I did that day when I finished boiling? I went back out behind the sugar house. I got that mouth. I put him right back in the air. And I used him like a tea bag for the whole rest of the food. Okay, seriously, do you want to focus on quality of production? And it doesn't take a mouse to make quality. We want to be really careful about everything we do. Um, so, we're going to focus on techniques and boiling. Now, some of you have seen these pictures. We used some of them last time. But it doesn't matter what you boil on. We can make good quality syrup on just about everything. Um, but we've got to keep our place looking good because visual perception has a big part in whether or not people want to buy your syrup. They want to feel confident about where it comes from, who makes it. We don't want to dress in the same clothes we spread manure with that morning. Uh, we want to kind of tidy up a bit and hopefully smell a little bit good. I know it's been a long winter and all, but It'd be okay to take a shower before you boil, especially if you're going to invite people in. Uh, so be sure that everything looks good. This doesn't look good. It's quaint and all, but it just doesn't look good. Okay. Design, lots of things. Evaporators can be big or little. It doesn't matter. We can make really good syrup from them. Um, yeah, size everything appropriately. Uh, be careful moving in your new evaporator. Measure everything. Sack coming in, we're ready to boil. Where's the mouse? <laughs> okay, we'll stop on the slides for just a moment. And I'm going to move over here. I've done some artwork. I hope you appreciate the effort it took to make this artwork. But this is a, a, an aerial view looking down on a typical evaporator. Can you imagine this is the base stack back here, the fire doors, the burner up here. We're putting sap in through the float box, let's say at 2%. The flow is going to go back around this partition, 
down this side, through the connection here, into this pan, and finally out here. What's the sugar content coming out? Who knows? 60.7? Okay, let's just call it 67. And if we sell it to Anderson's, they really don't care what the sugar content of the finished syrup is. All we need is here. <laughs> okay, so what we want to have happen, we want to manage this evaporator so that the numbers I put in are going to be there all the time. So it's 2% coming in. And we'll do the same scenario with an arrow ahead of this in a minute. But this whole back flue pan, where 75% of the water is removed, by the time it exits this pan, it might be at 8%. So it takes this whole pan to get rid of 75% of the water. That's where most evaporation happens. We come into the front pan, and this compartment might be up to 12%, and then 22, 40, and 65 over here. When it's 67, we draw it out. We want everything to run very smooth and steady. Have you ever been in your neighbor's sugar house when he thinks it's like this, but these two compartments back here might be at 80%? Yeah, now that's never happened at our sugar house, but your neighbors could have a problem like that. <laughs> How do you know when you've got a problem like that? How can you diagnose it? Looking at the boil, but that takes a really experienced eye. Put a thermometer in, that could work. And, you know, I worked with Bob Crooks, Marklin guy, uh, and I told him, let's do thermometer probes that could go in the various compartments. And we actually do that at our evaporators. I have a thermometer probe in every compartment. So you can see a problem like this coming along. But a really good way, and some of these old fellows around know just what it is. You take your dipper, stick it in gently, don't stir anything. Gently stick it in and then hold it up. If it aprons off that dipper, you've got syrup. Okay? And if that aprons here and here, it's a problem. How are we going to fix that problem? What's the solution? Other than running around, flapping like a crow, hollering and yelling, how do we fix it? Yeah? Okay. So this might be at 45, and this is 70. So let's draw that 45 out. That 70 is going to fall right along. It doesn't have any choice. It's going to push right in there. And as you do that, you watch your dial thermometer come from maybe 4 degrees, right up to 7, and keep right on going, and then it'll come back down. So the key is to diagnose the problem before it's a big problem, right? We actually want to catch it before it's 67. Wouldn't it be nice if we could catch it at 60? And take the precautions, get that bucket out of there. What do we do with the bucket full that we draw out to make room for the heavy to come in? What do we do with that bucket? So right now, let's just set it down. we got bigger fish to fry right now. So let's set it down and get things in control. And then gently, we assume that that was at 45, so it should dump in here very gently. Then we won't darken the syrup. If we dump it in over here, we could but gently dump it in. It's cooling down. When you dump it in, it's going to kill the boil, isn't it? And so we want to do that really gentle so we don't kill the boil. Okay. Does that all make sense to everybody? We want to drive our evaporator like we drive our car. <coughs> If you've ever been out on icy roads with your car, sometimes your car drives you, doesn't it? We want to be in control always of our evaporator. I want for you to make boiling sap the 
most relaxing thing you ever do in your life. Okay? And it can be. <laughs> Beer and evaporators do not go well together. I know we're in the great state of Wisconsin. Yes? Let's take a look at that. And that's the key question to ask, isn't it? What caused this in the first place? Can we take precautions next time so it doesn't happen again? I'm going to go back to my mouth story. Remember that second day I boiled? When I shut down my evaporator, I had no idea what I was doing. So I just let the fire go out. The sap had stopped coming in, and I went home. Now, what really happened in this evaporator while I was gone? The sweet that was over here mixed with the whole front pan. When the fire goes out, there's no more segregation. It all mixes and blends and homogenizes. And even worse than that, some of that sweet got around and went right in the bottom of these flues. So you start up the next day, where's the hottest part of your fire? Right in the middle. On the side, you get bricks sucking up some of that heat where they're a thermal mass and it takes energy to warm them up. So this is always the hottest part of the fire, regardless of what fuel we burn. And so everything's homogenized. We make syrup here first. So what's the trick? What do you think we can do? Yes? Now I do when I'm the end of the Yeah? If the syrup is at 67, I keep taking some off of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, take off all you can get off. Now, a little trick to bait the trap is let's let that last batch of syrup go a little higher. Okay? If we're drawing at 7 degrees, let's let it get up or in, the, in the 8 to 9 range, and then we'll draw some light out that might be only 62% to blend that heavy down to get as much speed out of that pan as we can. Then, when we know we've got all the syrup out that we can get today, let's draw another pailful of very close to syrup. We're going to label that as pail A. Then, a second pail that's a little further away, so in effect, we're getting all the 60% out, and we're getting most of the 40% out. So pale A is at 60, pale B is at 40. We set those aside where the mouse can't get in it. Okay? Let it cool down. And then tomorrow when we fire up, we're probably going to switch sides, aren't we? We're going to feed this side and draw from this side. So we reverse the rotation of all the feeds, and we're going to dump that pail A where? Now we're going to dump it in right here, and it's going to push this stuff right back. But you know what? We better dump pail B in first, because that's the 40. I'm sorry. So we dump pail B in, it pushes back. Then the pale A pushes the B around. That sort of makes sense. We now set the gradient on this machine so it won't do that trick to us today. And it's a very neat trick. Plus, the other thing we can do when we drain our filter press out, any syrup that comes out of that filter press, leave room enough in pale A so we can dump the gradient there. And then we're in great shape. I usually know if you're in the middle of the second last syrup on it, I drain all the syrup out of it into my holding pan. Mm -hmm. It's all mixed together mm -hmm. with lots of sugar. Mm -hmm. And I put it back in. Mm -hmm. Okay. The downside of that is now your whole front pan is the same. Mm -hmm. Hottest part of the fire is in the middle. We're going to make syrup in the middle first. So save out the sweeter stock, separate from all the rest. And uh, put it in, keep it segregated. We can do that in pails pretty easily. And then put it back in in the same pattern that it should have been in in the first place, as if we never stopped. Now, the back pan, 
It doesn't matter. That's going to homogenize. It's okay. It's weak enough back there. It really doesn't matter much. So, and many of you are going to have to wash your entire pan system every day. Some of you won't. Um, and washing pans isn't a matter of cleanliness or sanitation. Washing pans is a matter of getting rid of the nitre buildup, the mineral deposits that can inflate the pan and eventually build up to a point where they can burn. Now, if you don't own an arrow machine, you can go a long time without cleaning the interior of your pan. But as we put more volume of syrup through smaller and smaller pans, the nitre accumulation happens in a smaller and smaller space. So we're going to get a heavier deposit. That's the one downside to reverse osmosis. Is we're using smaller pans to make the same product, and we build up nitre faster. Now, at our place, we like to switch our rotation, like we just talked about, every hour of boil time. How do we do that on the fly? Don't turn the heat down. We do the same exact procedure. We draw up pail A and pail B. We close the feed coming in, so we let the pan go down a little shallower, but there's nothing close to syrup in it now, is there? We're not going to burn anything. Get that pan down as shallow as we dare, and then dump pail B in. It pushes around. Pail A behind it, it pushes around. And we set our gradient to the other side, and then switch your flue pan, and away we go. And you'll make syrup again. If you want to see this done in actuality, my youngest daughter Sarah has got a video, a YouTube video, that shows her doing this very thing on a 6x16 six uh, Lockyer turbo unit at Cabot. Uh, and she is just as calm as a cucumber doing that whole thing. Uh, so proud of her for being able to do it. But we let the pan go down a bit, we bring the product where it needs to be. Then we open the feed to the other side and let it bring it back up and that dilutes down the other side. So you can see in effect what we'll have if we take up the 65 and the 40, we move the 22 clear over to here. Then when we open this side, we're bringing 2% right in and pushing that 22 around and it all comes in the same gradient that it should have been in in the first place. So it's really pretty easy. Shouldn't be anything you're afraid to do. And by doing this, we can make that evaporator go a lot longer than we could if we just drew off the same side all the time for the whole day. Any questions or thoughts about that? Let's take another look at it if we're concentrating with an RO. How high would you like to see the RO go to in this analogy? Pick a number. 20. Okay. Let's throw 20 in there. What's this number going to be? Same. Same. We don't want that one to change at all. When we take 20 bricks, concentrate, how many gallons of 20 bricks does it take to make a gallon of maple syrup? You know what your number to divide into is? 86. 86? No, we're not. Okay, 86 is the number if you really go by USDA standards. But your hydraulics, don't tell your consumers that. Because we tell our consumers that Vermont syrup is the heaviest in the industry. <laughs> but you're using the same hydrometer that we use. And so it really isn't any different. The real number at Vermont standards is 88. Okay? So 88, we put that number down, and we divide that by the bricks that we're looking to use, so 20, and 4.4 gallons of concentrate to make a gallon of maple syrup. So now let's take three quarters of the water out of that. This gets a little complicated, but don't worry, we'll be all right. By the time we get over here, 
We're going to be somewhere in the uh, hmm, maple candy stage. No. I'm sure. just going to take a flying <laughs> guess at this that we might be coming in here at 55. And then we get down here, we're getting to 57, 60, 63, 65. So it's just a guess, but it's probably pretty close. Um, you see everything's really working the same way. But here's what we're going to notice. If we had trouble making syrup in the middle before, we just compounded that problem in a big way. Because the difference between these two numbers and syrup ain't much. So we have to be really watchful. And that same old scoop that Grant used, we can use today and reach in there and test it and see what's coming along. Or we can put a thermometer probe in there. If you've got cross flow front pans, there's thermometer ports in those cross flow front pans that you can put thermometer probes in and know exactly what's coming along at you. Yes? Yes? So we've got to know what's going on. Yeah. So the thermometer probes become even more important, don't they? So again, cross flow front pans. We can get a thermometer probe in every compartment, and we know what's coming down the road at it before it's a problem. And uh, especially when we switch on the slides, uh, we know what to do. Okay. So. Boiling should be something really fun, not too difficult. Uh, now if we want to go to what we do at Eden, uh, let's turn this number 30. Now I won't put all the numbers in, but you can see it happens really fast. And so we need a special evaporator to boil really high bricks concentrate. That's what I'm getting at. What we designed into our Eden facility at first was big, giant, flat pan evaporators, and they worked really nice. Uh, Andy Sipple's got one. Um, I don't know if you've been to his place and seen it, but he boiled 30 bricks concentrated as well. And uh, so what's our evaporator look like? Well, it's 20 feet long, 7 feet wide. There's um, four flat bottom pans. Uh, that measures seven feet wide by four feet long. There's four of those, and then a four foot long flue pan way out on the end. And you won't even believe this, but that flue pan never boils. All it's doing is heating up that concentrate to get it to near boiling temperature. And then it comes in the flat pan. So all the evaporation happens on flat pan. And we're going to bring Grant back into the picture. His evaporator, let's say it was a 4 by 14, it had a 7 foot flue pan and a 7 foot front pan, and he made beautiful syrup, didn't he? Then the Canadian influence happened. They want us to become more efficient, which was a good thing. So instead of that 7 foot flue pan, they made it a 10 foot flue pan, and now there's room for a 4 foot flat pan on the front. It boiled faster, it's more efficient, uh, everything was nice, but maybe our syrup quality declined just a smidge. And so this got us back to where we were making the same characterized flavor of the old days in a new and modern and very efficient way. Uh, 30 bricks coming in, and uh, I'm going to just show you something really interesting. If you take this pan and switch sides, what's the differential? We're at 57 degrees, or bricks on this side. Is that going to dissolve niter off this bottom? Not very effectively, is it? It helps a bit, but it really doesn't uh, 
Yes, now let's take away this flue pan, and imagine this is my whole evaporator. We've got 30 bricks coming into flat pan, where we just made syrup. And we've got our 67 over here. 30 bricks can dissolve nitre off the pan. So by switching ends, we were able to uh, dissolve nitre again. And so it was more effective than what we used to do. Does that sort of make sense? Uh, so we work everything together as a package. Uh, it's, it's hard if you change an RO and have to change the evaporator the same year. Your wife kind of looks at you like, yeah. yeah, and the frying pan comes out and it ain't to cook bacon with. <laughs> Seriously, we have to work things together if we go really carried away. Okay? So, this works. We want to be careful about it, but uh, we can make it work nicely. Good. Any questions or thoughts? Cleaning pans. Here's a marketing tool, amazing marketing tool. You can tell your consumers that you need to clean your pans every day. They build up mineral deposits, just like a tea kettle would do if you used it on your stove a while. And you've got two choices to clean those pans. We could either use an acid solution or we could use demineralized water to clean your pan. Where can we get demineralized water? Yeah, yeah, not our own machine. Yeah. Isn't that a good sales feature for your wife? We can make demineralized water. But now the consumer has a greater feeling about you because you're using a environmentally friendly cleaning method instead of something that might not be. Now, if you do need to use pan acid, don't just throw it away when you get done with it. You can use that again tomorrow. We put ours into a poly tank, store it overnight, use it again the next day, and the next day, and the next day. As you use it, you need to keep adding a bit of acid, but you don't need to throw away that acid that you've worked to build. The acid we typically use is phosphoric acid, and that phosphorus is what we want to keep out of our waterways. The acid isn't really harmful to plants. Uh, not even, yeah, if directly consumed, yes, it could be harmful to animals. But it isn't like that at all. We would follow a rinse of our pan and dilute that down. Uh, or even neutralize it before we discharge it. But let's not buy that acid day after day after day, let's reuse it, reuse and reuse, recycle. Uh, then we don't have to throw it away. So we use our, our pan acid for many days. We'll go about half the season on the same acid. And then right outside our sugar house is a cornfield, and we can disperse that acid on the cornfield, and it's fine. Uh, no problem. On frozen ground, it's not such a good thing because it had to throw a lot away. But, good. Okay. If there's any questions, please ask. Yeah. How much of the permeate do you need to use to actually break down the nitre? Yeah, so it depends how heavy the buildup is. Um, if the buildup is reasonable, then it, it, you can just soak the pan and permeate overnight. If it's a heavier buildup, then you want to power it through by a sump pump or any kind of thing like that, pulling it through the pan continuously, recycling it. Or all the evaporator companies now have a spray system, a CIP system for their evaporators, so that that machine could spray water into the pan, very aggressively attack that mega buildup. So the better job you do of moving it, the less it takes to get the job done. Um, good. Just checking my time. Okay, we've 
we've got about 15 minutes left. Efficiency of boiling is really, really important today, isn't it? Back when we burned wood, did it cost you anything for the wood that you burned to boil fat? Yes, it does. Now, we told ourselves that it didn't, because it made us feel better. But it really does. And I'm still paying the price of burning wood that I stopped doing 20 years ago. My back will never be the same again. Um, I would put up like 150 cords of firewood in the month of May years ago. And seven cords a day was kind of a typical day for me. And block it, split it, stack it. Um, and some of the blocks I picked up to put on the splitter were heavier than I should have been. So my back is in trouble now. Every once in a while, like uh, nowadays, six times a year, I have real serious back trouble. And eventually it goes away, or always has. We'll hope it still does. But. So we want to take care of ourselves and maybe not abuse ourselves as bad as that. Uh, I had this awful addiction to making a lot of maple syrup, and that's the price that I pay now. Um, so, Try to become efficient, and whatever you use for fuel, try to minimize it. And again, your consumers will thank you for that, because the greener you can be, the better they're going to like you. You wouldn't think that that would matter to them, but it does. Um, we now, at our place, have such a tiny carbon footprint, around 6,000 acres of ground, and the amount of fuel that we now burn is about equivalent to heating, oh, maybe eight houses for a winter. That's all the fuel we burn to make our crops. So our carbon footprint is really tiny. We're actually working on a project right now that will be able to sell carbon credits to companies that have a huge carbon footprint, a little tiny plot of ground, with a great big factory standing up on it, and to sell carbon credits so they and their people can feel good about what they're doing. Um, doesn't make a lick of sense, but if they want to pay for it, I don't mind putting my hand out. So, uh, it's a project in itself. Uh, we've got a guy working on it, and maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, but that's something. And be sure to portray that to your consumers. Let them know how environmentally friendly you are. Because they may get some information from somebody that tells them, oh no, these guys are polluting everything. Um, when in fact we're not. If we're careful, we don't have to have an environmental impact. Uh, we can do things in a very good way. Okay, so now let's kind of digress back a little bit. We want to, to make this function the way we've put it up here. There's four key things that we need to do and be serious about it. The first one, and most important, we have to have a steady heat source under this pan. And we can do that with wood, with oil, with propane, with natural gas, with electricity. Any of those can work. Um, and probably the toughest one is wood. So the secret of burning wood and keeping steady heat is if your evaporator has two doors, you only open one door at a time. You fire the right side, you set an egg timer for five minutes. When it dings, you go to the left side and put a layer of wood on it. Set the egg timer for five minutes back to the right side, and so on. You don't want to have it burn clear to the grates and then throw a big batch of wood in there and start all over again with the whole thing. By firing one side at a time, you'll keep steady heat on the pan all the time. When you put wood into an evaporator, that wood is cold, isn't it? And there's always moisture in it. It takes a lot of heat from the fire to bring that wood up to combustion temperature. Then, 
you can't see this happening maybe, but what's happening really is that wood starts to turn from a solid into a gas. And it's the gas that burns. If you watch a campfire, you can see this very thing happen. You'll see smoke come out of a chunk of wood, and then that smoke catches the flame, and it starts to have a visible fire. So we want that to happen all the time. Um, so steady heat input, really, really important. The better the wood quality, the easier this is. Green wood, it's a no go. I'll heat my house with green wood, because it doesn't matter if it gets cold. Uh, <laughs> but to boil sap, we want nice dry wood. That's important. <coughs> Get your priorities in the right place. <laughs> okay. With oil, to be honest, it's harder to have steady heat with oil than it is with wood. With oil, we get a hot spot right there where the fireball is. Everything else is cooler. And with oil heat, we reflect that heat to the spots that don't have the fireball. Okay, so your arch is configured so it's reflecting that heat even to these corners that are hard to get heat to. And so the, the uh, construction of this firebox is really important. The nozzle that you use on your oil burner is really important. You want the flame that the manufacturer of this machine intended for you to use. So contact the manufacturer and find out what nozzle they recommend for this particular machine that you have. Okay. And propane and natural gas, same thing, but it's much, much easier. Uh, those fuels are unbelievably good. If you can burn natural gas, you've got it made. Uh, you'll be so, so handy with this. Uh, just can't get enough of it. Now, with wood, when we start a day when we're ready to light the fire, the first step should be to brush the flues. We're going to get carbon buildup on the flues, and we should take a flue brush and run it through there and get that carbon off. Uh, second thing we do is to shovel the ashes out that we made yesterday, and then we're ready to kindle up a fire and make it go. Now, all of that procedure that I've just described, if I really hustled, that would take me an hour before I even light the match to start a boil. I didn't even think about this before I started to burn oil, but oil you turn the switch on and it's instant heat. So I saved myself an hour of time a day. That was nice. Does that mean an hour of more sleep? Oh no. It meant I just had more trees. Get your priorities in the right place. Um, if it looks like I missed out on a little beauty sleep, maybe I did. Um, okay, so steady heat. We all good on that? The second one is steady foam. As we boil, these pans are going to start to foam. Now, the good Italian chefs, when they cook pasta noodles, they use a little olive oil to break the surface tension of the bubbles so when they cook the pasta it doesn't foam over the top. Well, we do the same thing, but we don't use olive oil. Um, what I will suggest for you to use is the Atmos 300. If you're not certified organic, uh, it takes the least bit of that material to keep your pans uh, defoamed, and it's a non-allergenic product. If you're certified organic, there's two products that I recommend. Um, um, uh, yeah, in New York State, uh, Marty and yes, Org sixty. Yes, Org sixty is the product. Thank you. What was that? It's called Org sixty. Org. And if you look in the Maple News, you'll see an advertisement for it. Uh, it's a Kind of a new product for maple. It's not new for the food industry. But these defoaming agents are used in other applications of food products. Don't think that we're the only one that use Atmos 300 for defoaming liquids. Um, it's used elsewhere. This Org 60 is certified for most organic buyers. Yes? 
I find since I put my air injector in, mm -hmm. I use far less before. Exactly. That's a good point. With air injection or bubbler system, he's noticed he uses less defoamer. Now, using less is really important. I don't care what product it is you use, use less, the least possible. Defoamer should be added one drop at a time. Not a squirt, but a drop at a time. Where do we add it? That's I add it right here. And I use an automatic dripper so that I can program that in to drip however many seconds or minutes between drips that so it keeps the pans defoamed. A little four ounce bottle of defoamer, the Atmos 300, I can usually get a thousand gallons of syrup made with one of those little bottles. So try to use the least possible amount because anything you put in there is an additive, isn't it? And we really don't want to be putting an additive in a product. If we have to use vegetable oil, organically certified vegetable oil, because we're organic certified, um, organic safflower oil is probably the preferred, and because it has the least imparted flavor, uh, olive oil would have a strong flavor possible added to our syrup that we would want. Um, to be honest with you, my absolute favorite would be butter. But that's a dairy product, isn't it? And there are people with sensitive enough dairy allergies that it could put that consumer into an anaphylactic reaction, and we certainly don't want that to happen. And they didn't talk about that in the, uh, the lawyer talk this morning thing. You remember that talk? Yeah, I didn't talk about that. So, anyway, put it in here. It'll take care of the whole food pan easily. It'll take most take care of most of your front pan as well. If you need to add a little additional, be careful where you add it. If we add this compartment is foaming, and we add the foamer here, that foam is going to go toward this where we drip it in. So sometimes we can use the foamer to lead the product to where you want it to be. Normally where I want it to lead it to is here. But that would be a spot to add the foamer. But one drop at a time. Thank you. Yeah. It'll circulate fine on its own. 
I've even watched producers get in here like they're in a canoe with a surf scoop and they paddle away to get the surf to move. Because it ain't gonna move on its own. Liquids tend to seek their own level, don't they? So you take some out here, it's replaced from here to here to here to here, right back through. Okay? The final one is steady draw. And this is the tricky one. We really should see this be a steady stream of syrup, non-stop, the whole time we boil. It's theoretically possible, and actually, in some cases, people can do it. But if we can't do it exactly, we want to approximate steady draw. So the old days of opening the valve wide open, don't do it. Because if you do, you start a tsunami flow this way. And then when you shut that valve, it stops instantly, and we get a and we just mix the whole thing. So we open the valve, and I'll tell you a quick story, because we're just about out of time. I sold a new evaporator, and it was a big one. It was a turbo 3 5 by 16 unit to a family that I knew was canoe paddlers. <laughs> I'd heard the story. I hadn't seen it for myself, but they were paddlers. And it took three guys to run this machine. And so I sold the new machine, and my philosophy is I go with that machine and boil with them the first day. So I go, and there's a teenage girl, junior high, probably 12, 14 years old. And I said, how would you like to run this evaporator to draw the very first surf that comes out of it? Oh, I don't know. I don't think I can. I said, what jobs do they let you do? Well, I get to sweep the floors and wash the tanks. <laughs> That's fun. Let's have you run this evaporator. Now, the dad and the grandfather are kind of standing back, giving me a little room. And I said, when I tell you, you open the valve about like this. And so the time came, and she opened the valve just perfectly, and a stream of syrup starts coming out. And these guys are just like a horse chopping at the bit. And they want to get in there with a the paddle and start moving stuff. <laughs> so, just stay put. She's doing a great job. And that little girl made that shirt come off just as steady as could be. And that draw lasted for a good 20 minutes. Untouched. She didn't touch the valve again. The thermometer stayed right there. The density in the draw bucket was just perfect. And those guys just, the draw, jaw was right on the floor. They couldn't believe it. Now, did that girl ever get a chance to boil again? Oh, no. <laughs> it doesn't take huge experience to know how to do this. If you just study the science a little bit and see really what's going on. When a pan foams up, it can't circulate. If this is foamed really high, you can draw out of here, but it's not going to replace. So you'll burn in the middle. Get rid of the foam, and then it'll nicely across the pan, and it's as easy as can be. So, 14-year-old girl can do just fine. Any questions? We're out of time. Yes, sir? I know we're out of time, but... No, no, we get lots of questions. That steam away process, I, I don't get that. And then the air injection. Okay. So, steam away. The steam that our flu pan makes if you understand the thermodynamics of how that happens, we're putting a lot of heat under that flue pan to turn liquid water into steam. That same energy is available to come back to us if we condense the steam back to water. It's a thermal cyclone. And so the fire puts heat in, we turn water into steam. The steam wave then condenses that steam by exposing sac to pipes that have steam inside them. And that brings the sac temperature up to a temperature approaching 200 degrees. Then we bubble air through that 200 degree sac. Have you ever been around a hot tub like this one out here? Have you noticed it today? It's steaming away out there. It's evaporating pretty nicely. Now if you turn the air on that hot tub, you'll see a huge cloud of steam come out. That's how steam wave works. It's the air that would bubble through that hot sack that makes it evaporate. 
Otherwise, it's just a glorified free eater. The air injection, it's like a steam line, only it's a different intention. It's not there to try to increase evaporation rate. It's there to keep nitre moving across the pan, to lessen the need for defomer, and to make our syrup a bit lighter and maybe more flavorful. Only in the front pan? We use it in both front and food pans. On a steam pan, we don't. We don't do any air injection there. Any other questions? How many ladies here do the boiling at your sugar down? Do you? Nice. Let's fix that. The next time I come here, I want to see a lot of ladies' hands go up. When I teach somebody new how to boil, it's so much easier to teach a woman how to boil than a man. <laughs> because typically, and I don't mean to, to categorize anybody, but typically women are around boiling things a lot more than men is. They are typically a lot cleaner. They typically can pay attention to more than one thing at a time. <laughs> and I think I could go on for a while. <laughs> now, putting wood into a mammoth wood arch, maybe they're typically not as good at that because it takes physical strength to do that. So let's give the guys that one. But women can often do a much better job of boiling than men can. Yeah. So break the mold. And guys, put your butt out in the woods where you can amount to something. Put the basket up. Let the women do the boiling. And it'll all be good. By the way, my wife doesn't boil. <laughs> But my youngest daughter does, and she did a marvelous job at it. And go ahead and look at a YouTube video of switching sides on the fly. It'll be amazing. We are really out of time. Thank you, folks, and uh, have a good rest of the day.